Hi, and welcome to the inside of my head, where today, me and my alternatives are looking at one of my favorite franchises and trying to pinpoint exactly where and when it derailed and how we ended up with this arson catastrophe. We look at what was great about it in the first place and we take a look at how far it sunk. So if you love all things Star Trek, Star Wars, Transformers, MonsterVerse, Marvel, DC, and sci-fi in general, then this is the channel for you. So track down that subscribe button and stomp it into the ground and join us. <laughs> Mr. Normal Person is completely normal. So first up guys, I just want to say this video is quite a personal look at when the franchise died for me. Most people will have differing opinions and that's fine. Um, I know lots of people love this franchise and grew up with it and are sensitive about it. I'm really sensitive. And I completely understand that because you see, Star Trek was more than just a show to me. Oh. Oh. It went all the way back into my youth, almost like a sibling. My first memory of it was this. Ah! And it must have been about eight and ah! it was ah! fucking ah! terrifying. Ah! I mean, look at what's going on here. This is horrific. Anyway, most of this franchise went well over my head. I mean, um, as a kid, I didn't really get it. Um, it was too slow, it was too wordy for a young boy who was into transforming warring robots and masks and thundercats and ring raiders. Remember that one? Jesus. And then this came along. That's the wrong theme tune! If you're gonna sing the theme tune, sing the right theme tune! Better, thank you, much better. Um, according to Wikipedia, it started airing in 87, so I wouldn't have seen it till later, maybe 92, maybe 93. Uh, and the first episode that I can actually remember was the one with the crystalline entity. And it blew my fucking mind. Could there really be evil, sentient, giant snowflake creatures floating around in space, destroying entire planets? I mean, it's not impossible, right? To my cynical old eyes now, well, it seems kind of ridiculous, but my imagination was captured. So every Wednesday evening at 6.25, I'd be in front of the TV. The technology they had to a 90s kid was mind-boggling. They explore the galaxy in this thing? Look at it. It's amazing. It's beautiful. And it splits in two? Oh my god, they have these wireless handheld computers that they just carry around like some kind of tablet? It's all me, baby. It's all me. Uh, actually... Shut up, you dork! And everything is touchscreen? And what the fuck, they have video calling? Like they can see the other person they're talking to? I mean, you forget now, but none of those things were commonplace back then. This was even before dial-up internet was a thing. And all the characters just got along somehow. Differences of opinion were handled maturely. The logic being that when everyone has the common goal of space exploration, when money no longer matters, you don't need to bicker about whether you're not getting a promotion or you feel depressed that the neighbors have got a better car than you. Sure, there was conflict, but it was mainly from an external party, like the Romulans, for example. And looking back at it now, it's basically socialism in space. But to politicize it is to spoil it. So I'm going to leave all that stuff out. And sure, there were plenty of cringe moments. And... There must be a cure, some formula. <laughs> and I am not a merry man. And <laughs> actually, there's a hell of a lot of them. But it was very easy to overlook when you had a universe this rich and characters that you ultimately liked. Then came along DS9 which, although was moving into darker territory with the Dominion War, felt more like an expansion of the same universe. And the same goes for Voyager, with the ship thrown into the Delta Quadrant. It all seemed to fit very nicely together. As I just mentioned, none of these shows were perfect. They all had plot holes. Every episode would create this huge problem which would ultimately be solved by like a, a long-winded explanation. The system is controlled by three primary main processor cores, cross-linked with redundant Melacourt's Ramistat 14 kiloquad interface modules. The core element is based on an FTL nanoprocessor with 25 bilateral kilolactrals. With 20 of those, 
being slaved into the primary Heisenfram terminal. Now, you do know what a bilateral kelelactral is. And then somebody pushing three buttons and then everyone going, oh, thank God for that. You know, it was all a bit too easy. But what they were all very good at doing was creating a level of immersion um, some way that you were drawn into this and on some level, somehow, it felt like it could be real. A part of that was the richness of the detail. Another thing was the visual uniformity. You could see that these three shows all had some kind of continuity running through them. They all felt like the same universe. The sound, the visuals, it was all very immersive. And another thing I loved about these three shows, and this is in hindsight because I didn't realize it then, but one of the things that I loved about it was this feeling of this lone ship or station in the case of DS9. This lone ship way out by itself, far from home and in dangerous territory. DS9, for example, was the last bastion of the Federation on the gateway to the Gamma Quadrant and all its unknown dangers. And this feeling of isolation in space was something that really got me. And just as Voyager was coming to a close, they commissioned Enterprise. And obviously someone somewhere wanted to take it in a new direction. So they jumped back in the timeline to show the very first spacefaring Enterprise. And from about 20 seconds into the title sequence, I knew we were all in trouble. It's been a long road. Every time this title sequence played, Getting from I had to shove my fingers my time is into my fucking ears, up to the knuckle, and yell, I mean, what is this? You're giving me country and western, you motherfuckers? Where's the feeling of the epicness of space? Where's the optimism for the future? Where's the wonder and awe at the beauty of the universe? Where's the feeling of human triumph in overcoming our petty squabbles to expand the scope of our very existence? All of these things managed somehow to come across in the TNG, DS9 and Voyager sequences. And here, we have a scrapbook collage to the tune of soft rock. The one thing I'm getting from this is... Murica. I mean, what? Who funded this show? The fucking NRA? I mean, based on this title sequence, I'm surprised they didn't redesign the Enterprise to look like a Ford Raptor. I mean, after listening to this, I wouldn't be surprised if the episode was us having to build a big wall around the Earth to stop the Klingons coming in and taking our fucking jobs. Thank you. Oh my god, I hated that title sequence. But was that the moment that Star Trek died? Well, considering that everything since this has been utter toilet, I think that perhaps, yes. But I think that maybe it started even earlier. And for that, we have to go to the movies. Overall, the movies with the original cast were a very mixed bag in my book. The highlight being The Undiscovered Country. I love that movie so much. And the low point being Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, with the rest sitting in a puddle of mediocrity somewhere around the middle. But I watched them all, and I enjoyed them all, no matter how shit they were. Then it was time to hand the baton to the new generation, and Star Trek Generations came along. And at the time, I loved it. I even bought the book version of the movie and devoured that. I was really sad when Kirk died, and when the Enterprise-D crashes, I was really, really moved. It was like losing a friend. Then it was First Contact, and it wasn't until I re-watched that that I started to feel a little let down. We had a new Enterprise, which although was no 1701D, looked stunning. The first battle with the Borg Cube was awesome. The Defiant in there is kicking all kinds of ass, and it's perhaps one of my favourite space battles in the franchise. But after they travel back in time, there's not really a lot to write home about. Maybe the Zero-G battle on the whole, but that's really it. Most of this movie is really, really yawn. So perhaps this is the moment the franchise died, when the Enterprise entered that transwarp conduit. Or as I like to call it, a time orifice. It is true that everything after this point did seem to be shit. Good, 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 shit. So let's come back to it. I've got a few other ideas too. Insurrection felt like an elongated episode. And while that in itself is no bad thing, you kind of want more from the movies. Uh, the movies generally deal with a threat to Earth or to Kronos or to the galaxy. And this one was about this race that we don't know or care about. Ooh, my planet's keeping me very youthful. And perky. And about how this evil Federation Admiral is working with these bad guys to, like, harvest them. So sure, the stakes are high, but not to anyone we give a shit about. Nemesis didn't really deliver anything of note, even factoring in that Tom Hardy was the villain. But Nemesis really fucked up by introducing these guys. Now... 
Who are they? Well, let's go back a couple of steps and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my recollection is that we got the Vulcans, who have this sister race called the Romulans, who haven't embraced logic and are emotionally volatile and aggressive, but then they have this sister race called the Remans, who are even worse, and they're like these telepathic Nosferatu lizards, and one of them mind rapes Troy, and somehow, and I forget exactly how, but a clone of Picard ends up being raised by them, and then at the end Data sacrifices himself for Picard, and I was left feeling, well, like I should care, but I don't. And I think it's here that I noticed the shit bad guys that were creeping into Star Trek. Like, up till this point, we had relatively good bad guys. I mean, going all the way back, we had Vija, which was our very own Voyager probe that had been absorbed by an alien life form, I think, if I remember right, and then and then blown up into this huge thing. Then we had Khan. <laughs> who is a brilliant bad guy, who is this ultra-intelligent, muscle-bound geriatric who didn't care whether you think mullets are cool or not. He's doing it! Then we had the cylinder, you know, from Star Trek IV. Um, this black cylinder that appeared out of nowhere. I mean, what, had it been sent over from planet Greenpeace to save the fucking whales? What next? Are they gonna explode our sun if we can't motivate the panda bears to fuck? Do you mind if we just cuddle tonight? Okay. We don't know, but that was what was cool about it. We had General Chang, who was this Shakespeare-quoting Klingon general. And even episode 5 had a quite interesting concept where they thought they were going after God. So kind of weak-ass, but ultimately quite interesting. Generations had Malcolm McDowell, who's this crazy scientist, Dr. Soran, but ultimately he was just trying to get back into the Nexus to get back to his family. And while he wasn't the strongest villain, he was strong enough, he was interesting enough. The Boar Queen was one of the best things about First Contact, managing to be sinister and sexy and manipulative and evil all in one package. And again, like I said, one of the best things about the movie. In Insurrection, the bad guys were also pretty weak, um, but then it turns out that they were part of the race that they're trying to harvest. And also there's a little link in with an evil element in the Federation. So mm, not great at all, but... Not like these creativity dead zones. Oh, uh, hmm, what can we do for this one? Oh, well, Hellraiser was on TV last night. So let's let's take a Cenobite. Let's, um, let's make him half Cenobite, half Romulan. Let's give him telepathy. And then he can uh, mind rape Troy. And um, yeah, job done. Thanks. Back to my cocaine. And from here on, it only gets worse as we enter the creativity void of the age of reboots. And from here on out, it's just like standing under a waterfall of bullshit. And let's start the bullshit with the explosion of the Romulan sun. Out of the blue, bloop, the sun goes nova due to some unexplained phenomena that made it a supersonic supernova rather than what would actually happen if you obeyed any known laws of physics. So that takes out the whole planet Romulus. Then in an attempt to save the planet Romulus, Spock conjures up a black hole using this red matter stuff that's never been mentioned before in the universe. He creates a black hole to absorb the energy of the supernova. And that sends this guy, and Spock, back in time. Gotta get back in time. So, a black hole, yeah? The most destructive force in the universe that would literally split you atom from atom and scatter you into a void of nothingness. Yeah, but when JJ can't think of anything better... Come on, brain. Come on, brain. Don't fail me now, brain. It's actually a time travel device. You can't prove that it doesn't send you back in time. Yeah, well, nor can I prove that a brain-damaged blobfish writes all of your screenplays, but all evidence points to the contrary. So Nero goes back in time, and that puts us round about here. It looks like a lightning storm. What you sent us to Wait, hold on a second. Did he just say lightning storm in space? What kind of fucking airhead is this science officer? Captain, Captain, I just saw this flashy thing, and it, it, it kind of looked like the head of a dog. If I was the captain, I'd just be like, Oh, you saw a lightning storm in space, did you? Who let this guy on the ship? He's the science officer. He can't think of a better fucking term than lightning storm in space? That same anomaly, a lightning storm in space that we saw today. And now Kirk's doing it as well? Not a quantum gravitational singularity variation. No, that would be too nerdy. A lightning storm in space. And you know what this is? It's an attempt to get Star Trek away from the nerdy sort of image that it has and appeal to the cool kids. So anyway, Nero goes back in time and destroys the starship Kelvin, which has got Kirk's dad on it. And that sprouts off a whole new branch of the timeline. 
Although, in fairness, the first Kelvin timeline Star Trek was not god-awful, it was just painfully generic. You could easily swap this bad guy for any of these generic bad guys and it wouldn't make the blind bit of difference. And the whole thing felt like it was just one of those painting by numbers pictures where, sure, you can make a pretty picture, but it wasn't really you that did it, was it? It's not, there's no creativity involved. All of these guys, rather than acting, were just doing impressions of people who actually had character. And the direction was just weird with the Beastie Boys and the lens flares everywhere. Like, look at this. Is there a shot under there somewhere? Mars! And it just shows that these people are simply mimics. They're just trying to mimic people who actually knew what they were doing. It's like if you took a six-year-old child and told it to run its parents' business. The kid would be completely out of its depth, but it would try to replicate what it had seen its parents doing. Like, it would try and make a phone call. It would probably put the phone to its ear and then slam its hand down on the keypad and then go, Oh, get me, can you get me the producer on the phone? Because we need to crash the Enterprise. Oh, instead of Khan killing Spock, we can have Khan kill Kirk and then Spock could be the one who goes, Khan! Oh, I bored now. Did you see the rainbow? Anyway, getting back on track, Into Darkness was up next, and whilst Benedict Cumberbatch turning out to be Khan did actually catch me unawares, and there being a pretty cool portrayal of the Klingons at one point, it was just the exact same painted-by-numbers bullshit that wanted to seem like it was fucking with its own formula, but ultimately was just regurgitating the same elements again, and Star Trek Beyond, while trying to go back to what we all loved about the episode, also opened up with Kirk running away from gremlins and later evil Knieveling his way out of trouble and it's no more than an utter fucking farce. Seeing Sulu base jump and sword fight and Spock look to the sky as a volcano is about to consume him and Kirk fly through debris like a bullet makes you wonder, when did this become a comic? When did these people get superpowers? It's cartoony. And then this launched, and after another shit title sequence and a bunch of clearly forced race and gender representation politics, after seeing the worst representation of Klingons ever, I simply did this. And everything I've heard since has just reinforced my view that I simply don't have room in my brain for this confusing, annoying waste of time. I really wanted to see them pick up the timeline somewhere near where I last felt connected to it. But that also, and perhaps unsurprisingly, turned out badly, with them shitting all over perhaps the franchise's greatest character, then basing the plot on some Romulan son explosion refugees, there's some bollocks about Data's daughter and some droids going mental, there's Romulans building Borg tech, and for fuck's sake, it barely made any sense. Remember the episode of South Park where they find out it's just a bunch of walruses writing episodes of Family Guy, with them picking out random elements written on beach balls and then throwing them at a wall? Well, it seems like everything is written that way these days, and especially this. Cobbled together random bullshit elements. Anyway, I'll probably do another video looking at the shit mess that is Discovery and Picard, but right now I'm getting off point, because as much as I hate these shows, the franchise had long been dead by this point. So going back from that point, could it be Enterprise that fouled it all up? I mean, the decision to break the continuity was a jarring one for me. The universe had been moving forward on a logical path and everything seemed to fit together really nicely. And the decision to jump back to the first crew of the Enterprise was a jarring one and one that never sat well with me. But on top of that, the jump back in time meant that we were robbed of all of the technology that made the show special in the first place. Then we had this, the fuggliest ship design in the timeline in the worst CGI scene to date. Why the CGI was so bad, I can't quite figure out. I'm guessing budget issues, because Voyager looked better than this, and Voyager was before this. The more I think about it, the more I feel like Enterprise was supposed to be a solution to the problem of Star Trek fatigue, albeit a botched one. So if this was the cure, then where was the disease? Because the soul of the franchise died even earlier. So maybe let's take a quick look at Voyager. Now, I have fond memories of this show, broadly speaking at least. But there was a point where I felt that it got repetitive and tired somehow. The ship was at first in a long running battle with the Kazon. And then by the time the Herogen came along, we were all thinking, ah, okay, here we go again. Um, these guys are basically just the Predator character in a different skin. And, and it feels like we've seen this already. Then it was Species 8472, which was a massive letdown. 
At first, they seem like powerful aliens with unique abilities to shift in and out of our reality. And then over time, they just became kind of annoying, generic bad guys. We didn't know their motivation and they seemed a bit redundant. And then from there, the producers hitting the panic button and bringing up the big guns in the Borg to save the sinking ship. Four. No, 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 we're trying to raise the stakes here. Give me more. No, five. More. Fifteen Borg vessels. But at that point, it was too late. And yeah, I think we might have found it. Um, this is simply my opinion, remember, so no one get butt hurt. But the introduction of these guys, in a way, reminded me of that first experience I had with the Crystalline Entity. A brand new species with terrifying potential. You know, I saw this and I was really excited and I felt like this is what Star Trek does best. It presents us with an aspect of the universe that we, from our little blue dot, can barely even conceive. And then to have them fall back on the same old tropes and settle into the same old unimaginative routines and this bad guy becoming just another one of a plethora of bad guys was deflating. And it brought on the realisation that whoever was behind this show their hearts weren't in it anymore. So from this point on, neither was mine. So I'm going to say that the day that Star Trek died was the day that they introduced these guys and couldn't be bothered developing them into an unworthy adversary. Some will say that it happened even earlier and you could pick out several potential moments and I nearly picked Generations as the moment that the franchise died. And the only reason I didn't was that Generations came out in 94 or 95, something like that, and I was happily watching Star Trek well past that. But here is where I really felt it. I persevered through the rest of Voyager, and I was, on the whole, really satisfied when they arrived home back to Earth, but I never again felt connected to the franchise. And honestly, I really miss it. 